Hello, welcome to the September 29th, 2023 Club Cubase live stream. My name is Greg Undo and I'm the host of the live stream today. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you could submit uh, questions in advance by emailing clubcubase at steinberg.de or you can simply uh, ask questions in the chat field. Uh, today is the last live stream of the month, so as per tradition, we will have our Zoom meetup starting in about two hours. I will go ahead and post the Zoom, uh, the Zoom link so people want to join us. It's just a great way to kind of hang out and meet different people. Um, so let me just get this posted. And I'll try to post it about every 30 minutes or so. Um, so look forward to catching up with everyone. I know we had to miss the last uh, last Zoom meetup. Um, so looking forward to catching up with everyone. Um, so and if you have not so if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can ask questions again either in the live chat field or sending a questions to Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. When asking questions, if um, you could, you know, realize that my ability to answer questions in a real-time manner may soon be eclipsed. I'll try my best throughout the live stream to catch up and get uh, answers. Uh, but if you don't see an immediate response to your question, um, if we could refrain from asking the same question over and over again, um, that would be appreciated. When asking questions, if you could specify which version of Cubase you're running, whether it's version 11 or 12, uh, which uh, level of Cubase, whether it's Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, um, and which operating system, that information is helpful. Um, also, if we should have an index of all the topics uh, discussed in today's live stream pinned to the top of the comments field uh, with timestamps, you could refer to that. Also, if you wanted to look for uh, different topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to cubaseindex.com, and we want to thank Jan for creating that website. We also have two people that we want to give special thanks to, Agent K and Jazz Dude, who serve as moderators. And we uh, want to give a special kudos to Jazz Dude for his work with the Cubase Nation Discord. Uh, Jazz Dude and Agent K aren't Steinberg employees. They just kind of do it to make it a better community for everyone. So we want to give a special thanks to them. So once again, my name is Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America, which is the U.S. distributor of Steinberg products. Um, and I'm the host. I'm presenting from just outside of Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. So if you're watching this live or even if you're watching it afterward, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So again, we'll be migrating to the Zoom at about 3 o'clock, so about two hours from now. So let's go ahead. All right, so we see Stefan checking in from Sweden. Great to see you. We have Uno Memento checking in from uh, Finland. We're at 16 degrees Celsius. All right, we see Jan from Cubase Index. All right, we have Ogi from New York City. Glad you can make it today. All right, and we have uh, Roland's stuff. Just uh, sending greetings from Sussex in, the UK, in England. Thanks for being here. All right. We see uh, Jan giving special thanks to Jazz Dude for the uh, Cubase Nation Discord. All right, we see Soren from Sweden. Thanks for being here. All right, we have Richard Michael saying hello to everyone. We have Robbie Bowling checking in from Dallas. All right, so we just see a question um, from Tonu. It says, hi, if I have one question, what could be the problem with Cubase if fade in and fade out lags? Uh, Cubase 10.511 and 12. Uh, so let me know if it's just like a visual fade. So if we, you know, don't if you don't see it kind of reacting like this, this is pretty typical. Um, you know, so let me know if this is the fade that you're talking about. But even if I wanted to do this across, you know, multiple files here, and we'll just do 
you know, fades, fade out and fade in of all those files, we can see that it's pretty responsive. If you have some, if it seems like maybe it's taking too long, I don't know if you're off, you know, if it's doing an offline fade. So let's say if I come here and we go to, if I select this and we'll come over to audio and if we go to processes and we say fade in, you know, that could take, you know, that we could set and automatically have that fade in occur and that would process it offline but if it's just kind of the fades here if you're on windows it could be perhaps graphic card like your graphics driver if you're running an nvidia um, you could run i think it's the studio mode which is you know set up not for gaming but more for other conventional use and that may help the situation but if you could share if it's going to be like, you know, the uh, event clip fades, if that's what you're seeing. But, you know, my Mac and PC kind of both do that pretty responsively. But I could see where maybe a graphics display driver, we're maybe adjusting that uh, and taking out a gaming mode or driver update may help. So if you could let us know, that'd be great. All right, wonderful to see Michael Marshall from Somerset in the UK. All right, we have Richard Michael from uh, Swansea in Wales, UK. I think I called it Swansea or Swansea. So I looked it up in the map. So it's probably Swansea since it's on SC, but I could be wrong. All right, great to see Razel from Denmark. We have Barton from Germany, John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. All right. All right, so we see Jazz Dude just making a comment uh, to there was about the Steinberg online shop. Uh, so there was an announcement made this morning that with the AskNet, who was our provider for the online shop, who's the company we partnered with, uh, has gone into insolvency and we've closed the online shop. Uh, and we're currently looking for other providers. Um, so you could kind of read the announcement this morning. So if you're trying to buy an update from the Steinberg online shop in maybe a couple weeks during the transition. So, all right, so we see Electric who is, who is Beats. Uh, hey, Greg, will there be a clip launcher in Cubase 13? So generally we don't talk about any new features until it's actually released. So um, we'll have to see when Cubase 13 is released uh, and we'll see. Okay, so we see uh, from Tonu says, yes, and zoom out works fine, but some zoom in lags and work tools do not cut like in scissors with every Cubase version. So, you know, I don't know if you're running, you know, some sometimes when I've seen an issue like this is maybe if there's two display monitors and the two display monitors are running separate um are running different resolutions i've seen sometimes that that can be an issue so if you're running uh dual displays make sure that you're running kind of the same display resolution like i'm running in 1920 by 1080 resolution currently so but see if you're running the same display resolution on both All right, wonderful to see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas, and I believe it is Michael Teams' birthday today. So everyone wish Michael Teams a happy birthday. He kind of dropped a he kind of let us know that today would be his birthday on Tuesday's live stream. All right, so we see Benny he says he's going to try to be on the Zoom today, but he's a little sick. So we hope you're feeling better, and we hope to see you on the Zoom, even if just for a little bit. 
All right, so we see the artist known as Love saying hello to everyone. Thank you, Greg, for everything you do. And everyone hit the thumbs up or like button. So yeah, if you do learn a new tip or trick, make sure you do hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. All right, so we have Ash Rebel Hand Studios, just checking in from Brisbane in Australia. Great to see you on. Glad that you could join us in the middle of the evening from Australia. All right, so we see Jazz Dude wishing happy birthday to Michael Teams. All right. See if there's more questions that kind of sneak in. If not, we'll go to some that were sent in advance. Just hang on just a second. We'll let our give it a minute, see if we have more questions. All right, so we see from Ash Rebel Hand Studios, it's 3 a.m. in Australia. It's quite an early start for me. So, okay, so we see a clarification from Tone News as I run with uh, 1900 by 1200. But right now, I remove all Cubase files and reinstall it. Uh, can reinstall, fix that like if I reinstall from beginning or not, you can zoom in on the way and show how it is with Cubase, uh, the lag or not all the way in. Um, so maybe Tony, if, um, so one of the things that you could do is as you start Cubase, you know, it could be if it's going to be like a preference issue, I'll do this with Nuendo to show. So how to, how you could start in safe mode. So what this is going to allow you to do is you hold down Alt Control Shift on Windows or Command Option Shift on Mac right after you start the program. I'll just do this. So reinstalling it. If the preferences are the same, will remain constant. But this is a way to test. So right after you start the program, you could uh, hold down again Alt Control Shift on Windows. Command Option Shift on Mac, and you'll get this little safe mode for startup. So try to disable the program preferences and see if that changes the behavior. And if so, then maybe you could do the same thing and delete the program preferences uh, if that kind of resolves the particular issue for you. All right, so just kind of okay. So we see just from Tony um, says so uh, says um, if I install like that from beginner, can you zoom in all the way to show how it is with your Cubase to lag or not the way in? All right, so let me just uh, close this now. One thing that it could that sometimes. Uh, I'll show you another thing that may have an impact for you, Tonu. I'll just close out of Nuendo here real quick. All right, so when I zoom in down to like the sample level, um, it's like this. Now, one of the things that could, like if you find that you can only zoom in to a certain amount is if you go to your project menu and go to project setup, check the length of the project. By default, it may be 10 minutes. Um, I remember one time working with Eric Johnson's engineer and I had it set up for uh, two days as the project length. And when I go to zoom in, they could only get like this far. So check, just out of curiosity, 
if it's so as we kind of zoom in and this is typical behavior on Mac and PC for it to kind of be that responsive and as we work with that um, so check again go to project menu to project setup or you hit shift plus the letter S and at that point check just to make sure your project length uh, this will be uh, I think minutes, seconds, uh, hundreds of seconds, and hours. So check to see if your project length isn't kind of un unnecessarily long. Right. And that could present you, f prevent you from zooming in down to the sample level. All right. See a lot of people. We see Peter checking in from Montreal. All right, everyone's sending. I, everyone gets to send ice cream to Michael Teens today. All right, all right. So we have Miami in the house. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so we have Roland stuff. Question, uh, what's the simplest slash quickest way of replicating all settings from one track to another, including everything seen in the inspector routing, sends, etc. cetera, please? Um, so I think if we, we'll just come over here. Let's just add a send and let's add an insert or two. Okay, I'm going to just we'll add a blank audio track below. Okay, so I think if we come to this track and I think if we just right click here, we could copy. Copy first selected track settings. Let's go to here and paste settings for selected track. So now we come over here, we can have the same inserts, the same sends and same EQ. So just on the particular track, if you go to the top, right click and you can say copy for selected track settings and then go to the other track and paste the track control settings. So let me know if that makes sense for you, Roland. Okay, so we have Martins has a question. Um, so I have a question about F5 Media Bay. Uh, where to place example purchased vocal chop audio wave files perhaps in media bay user content audio files um so it could you know so like let's say if i wanted to look for um if it's a vs like a vst sound set like if it's a like one of the steinberg sound sets like let's say if i come over here and we see bloom and this will have kind of all of our all the different vocals that we could that we could audition through dimension am I in? so if we wanted to find this in media bay i would go directly to our media bay and we could go to vst sound and so let's say we're just looking for bloom and then we could just so the VSC sound or like, you know, sound libraries that you purchase from Steinberg, if it's one of those, then all of the different um, sounds here, we can just simply at this point uh, access them. If it's going to be a third party, like, you know, just kind of a generic like audio loops at that point, you could go to your computer and just go to 
the particular folder that you want. So let's say, okay, I want to go here to my desktop and I have a, I see audio files here that we could audition and see. So if it's going to be like one of the VST sound sets, you would find all of the content under VST sound. And then you'll see kind of the name of the library and that includes all the metadata, the project root key and all that information. So, so, but if it's a, you know, something maybe like a, a different company that just has, uh, at this point, wherever you would kind of just go to this computer and direct it to whatever file that you have copied the files into if it's not like a VST sound set. All right, so we see a question. Uh, which meter in control room is best to use for music to be on CD? Uh, you know, any of the meters will work. Uh, generally, I still, you know, in my control room, if I was doing CDs, you know, for streaming, you could have it kind of more optimized for, you know, different loudness standards. But, you know, I would probably just stick with the, with the general digital scale where you know zero is at the top it's pretty uh you know we when we have streaming services and for broadcast it probably makes sense to use more of the loudness units because that's the that's the loudness targets that they're kind of going for but for cd i would probably still just use the regular digital scale meter that's what mine is set to um, but I think once you know how to get the meters to kind of show what you want and for CD, it's not where it's going to be a set specified level as much as for streaming services. All right, uh, so we see um, how to connect Vocaloid uh, to Cubase 8. So unfortunately, I don't have a Vocaloid license. Uh, I used to have one a couple of computers ago. I don't have a current Vocaloid license, um, but I, I believe it's just gonna show up as a VST instrument, um, and you, you're able to just uh, run it as a VST instrument, but I don't have a license of Vocaloid, unfortunately. Always wonderful to see Kerwin Young from Atlanta on. All right, sorry, my chat field just jumped. Okay, so we see a question from Soren. Um, uh, Greg, is it possible to print the marker track descriptions to paper? Okay, so let's say if we have, I'll just quickly add some markers in. steal my lyrics all right just kidding all right so let's just add some more text okay so let's say uh, let's see if we can maybe do it in the project browser
So we can see our list there, and you might be able to do this in Nuendo. So let me just check in Nuendo. I think that you could probably just scan a picture here if you take a screenshot, and then I know you could put that into Excel if needed, but let's see if Nuendo has this option. And if Nuendo does it, if you want it, um, I'd be willing to, if you don't have a Nuendo license, I'd be willing, if you sent me a marker track to convert it for you, Sorry, Let's take a look. So I think we could export uh, CSV markers. Open this with Excel, I think. So we could um, export it in Nuendo as a CSV file, and then that could be imported into Excel and then in the description. But at that point, we could take that and you could convert it to text. Um, if you have uh, a marker track, since it's not kind of a function of Cubase, uh, if you want to send me the marker track or send me a project with just a marker track to Club Cubase at steinberg.de, I'd be happy to do the conversion and convert it into a .csv file for you, Soren. Great. So we see some mug engineer, which I believe is Marcos, just saying hi. Glad you can make it today. Great. All right. So we see. Um, Ash Rebel Hand Studios question, uh, is there a way to see the RMS level in the faders? Most other dogs have two levels being peak and RMS. Um, so I believe like as we would play a particular file here, so let's see. So let's say we look at this. That you could kind of see um, kind of the RMS and you see the peak indications just to the right here so you can see kind of the peak levels there um, but I don't think and I think you could use kind of the RMS levels you know and you could see that you know directly here on each 
you know, like as you're playing back in the master fader. But, you know, we could see kind of just visually, you get a sense of what the RMS and the peak are here. And you can see the peak indicated just to the right of this particular value. It could be a little kind of demure and a bit subtle. So. All right. Always wonderful to see Braxel on the live stream. Glad you could join us. All right, so we see uh, why is auto quantization so hard without having to manually go in and place everything where you want it? Um, so, you know, if you're doing, you know, so I'm not sure if it's audio quantize or auto quantization. So if you want to do auto quantize, it's just when we, you know, come right here, we see a Q. So let's say if I'm playing back um, and we'll turn our click on. So I'll just record and I'll just put in a bunch of Oh, I'm going to set my quantized value here, let's say, first to, uh, let's set it to quarter notes. Okay, so now that I have auto quantize enabled. So obviously I'm not playing quarter notes, then as soon as I, we're auto quantizing to the value. Uh, if you're doing it kind of within the editor, you know, so if we have uh, the grid turned on and we have our quantize value here set again to quarter notes, that now as I draw in notes, it's going to automatically quantize. So let's say now I want to do uh set this to half notes so whatever the quantized value is and let's say okay i want to do uh quarter note triplets we can see that it's just going to snap just like this so So that we could get our, you know, so let me know, but it seems like, you know, if you don't have snap turned on, then you could just like freely put stuff. But if you hit the letter J to enable snap, now it's going to snap to whatever your quantized grid is here. Sorry, let me turn my phone off. So, you know, make sure that you have snap turned on, but let me know, or if it's audio quantize, like if you wanted to, you know, quantize an audio event and you go to the quantize, make sure that you have the audio warp mode enabled right here. Otherwise it won't actually quantize. So say, okay, I want to do quantize this to 16th notes. And as we draw in, I could just say now as we quantize, you can see that that shifted slightly. Uh, you could do it like that, but it's not going to make any difference if you don't have the audio warp turned on there. So let me know if that's helpful for you. But I think it's not so hard. All right, John Costigan just says if you can spare a like, press it already. All right. So we see, um, so 
So I see, can you repeat the shift plus S, uh, what you told me and some advice more. So more, what could be more of that problem, what I asked. So if you go to shift S, this will open up the project setup menu. You could also go to your project menu here to shift S will open up the project setup. So make sure like your project duration is not set in the hours. So if I set my project duration here to three hours and 10 minutes, and now when I go to zoom in, it may not allow me to, let me just set it for higher. Let's say 10 hours, 10 minutes. So I can't go down to the sample level. So make sure that, again, go to your project menu to project setup and that you don't have, you know, see, see what your time is. The default, default project length is 10 minutes. You could obviously change that depending on what content is within the project, but that could prevent you from going down to the sample level when you zoom in. All right, so you see Sven Isaacson. There's one feature that I hope you can confirm that we won't see Cubase 13 it going rental. So, uh, you know, when, every time Steinberg has, you know, asked their customers, we do a simple thing. We ask the customers and they like perpetual licenses. So. So maybe not a direct confirmation, but. I think the business model will stay similar. Okay, so we see Martin just says, uh, I mean, third party purchased away files. Uh, and this is going back to our media bay question. So you just have to, uh, wherever they're copied to, just go directly to that particular folder. And if it's in this folder, just make sure that that particular folder is checked for it to go for media bay to look in that particular folder then you could right click and rescan disks and all the wave files will show up there if that's a folder that you want to frequently visit you could right click on it and add it as a favorite and then when you go to your favorites you could quickly just come when you go to media you could just say okay we'll go home and then just go to your favorites folder to have quick access to it. So once again, go to media menu, to media bay, find where the folder is, make sure that it's checked and you may have to rescan disk uh, and then it will search for all of the content in that particular folder for you. Okay, so we see Roland stuff says, thanks, Greg, to track settings. Replication you demoed made perfect sense. Thanks. And it's much quicker than the way I had been trying to do it. Cheers. Yeah, I guess you could always do it manually. You know, if you get paid by the hour, it's good. Uh, but if you don't want to pay yourself by the hour and get stuff done faster, it's probably a great way of doing it. All right, and we see just kind of a follow-up point from Martin, um, or does the content cover uh, WAV files by myself or user content? So generally the user content is going to be for not necessarily um, WAV files that are created, but these will be, um, you could have audio files there if you wanted to, uh, but generally the, this area is going to be primarily used for like your user presets, plugin presets, stuff like that. So I think that you would probably just go to my computer and then at that point, uh, you know, navigate to the folder, make sure it's checked and rescan right there. All 
All right, so we see uh, Zephaniah. Um, if I put four to five tracks, sorry, my then my chat field just jumped. Sorry, let me just find it. Okay, uh, so here's Zephaniah's question. Uh, if I put four to five tracks in a folder, et cetera, would help to save space on your internal or external hard drive. Um, so I don't think it's gonna change, you know, generally like a folder track is, um, you know, it's still taking the same amount of space. I think it's gonna take the same amount of space. Like when we have folder tracks on our project window, I could take like a number of tracks here and organize it into a folder but these files that are within the folder are still going to be taking the same amount of space so we could place them into a file folder um, that will take the same amount of space uh, you, but you know it's for primarily we could think of it as for organization or we could see um, you know but it's not going to necessarily take less space uh, and if we put it into like a folder track here, uh, this folder track will allow you to, uh, at this point, it's the files are going to take the same amount of space, but it's just kind of organizing it within your particular project. All right, so we see a uh, question, Greg, did Steinberg acknowledge the issue with the Cubase wiping anchors when opening multiple projects simultaneously? Um, so I'm not sure, uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure if they've officially acknowledged it. I think I remember a discussion about like, you know, the markers kind of getting reset for, you know, I think we had an email discussion, but, uh, and I, you know, I think we, I thought we had kind of worked through that. So I'm not sure if this is the same issue you're referring to. Um, but if you want to email me offline, um, I could dig through the emails again with that. Or if you want to refresh my memory on it. And I know we covered it, I think, in a live stream as well. All right, wonderful to see Matt Elliston checking in from London. All right, so we see, hello, please, does anyone have any experience with ASIO drivers that make two or more devices available in Cubase? ASIO for all doesn't work. Uh, I have RME, UFX, and Yamaha DM3S. Thank you, thank you. So, you know, generally the two devices, there's no way for them to clock. So that's, you know, when you go to ASIO for all doesn't work, it's because the two different audio interfaces, there isn't a way for them to resolve clocks between them so that's why we often don't see multiple devices being used and you know even if you're on aggregate devices on mac the clocking is still often uh, even if it's works on some devices work doesn't work on many uh, even if you do connect the clocks um, so you're always better to use one audio interface or an audio interface that could that is designed to use more than you know it's up to the driver itself so you know if you have pci interfaces if you have firewire interfaces thunderbolt interfaces they can be daisy chained between the same manufacturer often or running multiple versions of the same if you run something like a dante system you could chain multiple devices on dante because that has kind of a unified system clocking Wonderful to see Nick on. Glad you can make it from Essex in the UK, I believe.
All right, so we see from Soren, uh, nice work with Nuendo and the Marker Tracker X, Marker Track Export. Uh, we'll finish the Marker Track, and then I need Nuendo help. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, and send it, or you could always get the trial version of Nuendo if you haven't done that yet and run it for. I think it's a sixty-day trial. So, all right, great to see Steinberg MIDI on. Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button, and we we should listen to Michael Teams since it is his birthday. Wonderful to see Brian Sawyer Sr. from Beulahville, North Carolina. Hope you're well. Great to see you on the live stream as always. All right, so we see uh, Michael Teams has granted my family and myself one gallon of Scoopy's Black Diamond ice cream. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. My son will probably eat it all. So. All right, so we have a question. Uh, how do you properly use multiple sound cards, audio interfaces at the same time? Sample rate, uh, so audio wouldn't change when switching interfaces. Um, okay, so I'm not sure if you're using, um, how do you properly use multiple sound cards, audio, is, is, at the same time, sample rate, so audio won't change pitch when switching interfaces. Um, so it could depend on, you know, I'm not sure if you're using two audio interfaces within Cubase, um, or if you're switching back and forth between audio interfaces. So sometimes the audio interface will automatically follow the clock and sample rate in Cubase. Um, sometimes they don't. So like you, you saw the message when I opened up Nuendo earlier, it was asking me, okay, seeing a different sample rate, do you want me to change? And we could say yes or no, uh, but you know, you could have, so it, it really could depend on the audio interface. So some of them will uh, just switch to the sample rate of the project automatically and some don't. Uh, but let me know, you know, if you wanted to run uh, one audio interface on one program and one in Cubase and then switch back and forth or you want to run two different audio interfaces in Cubase. So. All right, so you see from Martin uh, about the Media Bay Favorites folder features says favorites will become my friend. So it's very convenient. All right, so we see, uh, hi Greg, when using the MIDI modifiers, random function, is there a way to make it randomize only one time and not continuously after each cycle, particularly randomizing pitches? All right, so let's come over and I will just put in some MIDI notes here. Okay, so we put these all in the same pitch. I will come over to my MIDI modifiers and uh, we could do this as um, like a plugin or if we just go to our MIDI modifiers uh, right here. So once we have, we'll say let's randomize pitch Right, so let's say we'll go up 12, down 12. So if we wanted to embed that, all we would have to do is just come over here and say freeze MIDI modifiers. And then we can see that those settings get turned off and that we can see now the random uh, notes that were, you know, previously they were all on the same pitch 
and now this will play back in a randomized manner so just once you have it set up as you expect um, choose to go to your MIDI menu and freeze the random MIDI modifiers and that way every time you play it's not going to do a completely different random thing so that will allow you to kind of capture uh, capture it and if you're doing it from you know there's also a MIDI modifiers plugin so sorry so if we come over to let's say our MIDI inserts and we open up the MIDI modifiers MIDI plugin you know we could change these settings and record the output so we can say okay I want to randomize the pitch uh, and we'll say down minus 12 up my up plus 12 so if I record the same exact pitch so we'll just solo this track here and I'm just gonna hit one note over and over again I'll just do it with my uh, virtual keyboard so you guys can all see All right, so when we see this little record mode, now I will place Cubase in the record. That we could record the changes uh, from that. But, you know, try just, again, coming over here to MIDI and choose to freeze MIDI modifiers. All right, I'm going to drop the link for the Zoom, which will be in about an hour and five minutes. I'll just add that link. All right, let's go back to some more questions. All right, always wonderful to see Millard Brown. Glad you could join us today. All right, so we see, uh, hi Greg, is there a way to monitor Dolby Atmos through NX Ambisonic? Um, so I believe that what you would need to do is, uh, I don't have NX Ambisonic, I mean, we could do it internally in Cubase through kind of the binaural monitor, but probably what you need to do is come over to Preferences, and let's go to Control Room, and you want to activate Use Phones Channel, as preview channel and then within the control room itself you'll go to the phones and you'll see click on the phones tab here uh, and then we'll see inserts and then you could just put i think this is where you would put the nx uh, monitoring plugin there uh, but, you know, with Cubase, you already have it kind of built in. So you have the binaural uh, monitoring uh, directly, you know, built in with Cubase 12. So. Okay, so you see uh, from Ash Rebel Hand Studios, uh, last week's live stream, you managed to emulate the issue with Cubase for getting the fader anchor positions. Oh, okay. Okay, so I remember the question now. So yeah, I, I did report that to Steinberg. So one of the things that was um, interesting about that, and I was playing around with it more, so I, I did report that, and it's officially documented. Um, so when we come over to thanks for refreshing my memory i appreciate that 
So one thing that's interesting about it is uh, we'll come here and let's say if I anchor my right channel, so we go to our visibility to zones and I'll anchor that and let's save this project. All right, so I'm going to close that project. Let's reopen it again. So here it, and I think it was, if we open up a different project, so let me do that. And then go back to it. That the anchor is not preserved, but if you open up the full screen mixer, um, if you open up, you know what we found is if you open up the full screen mixer, that the anchor will be preserved there. Uh, if it's if it's anchored in the full screen, but not in the lower zone mixer, so it you know it has been officially documented, so. So yeah, thanks for refreshing my memory on that. Ash Rebel Hand Studios. Always great to see Tiago from Brazil. Thanks for joining us. All right. Sorry, my chat field jumped. Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button, and it's his birthday, so everyone should do it. All right, so we see, uh, hey, Greg, uh, good day to you. I'm having an issue trying to import the program patches from my Roland and Core Grack sound modules. Uh, I cannot find them nowhere. Is there a way for Cubase to import the patches? So um, I'm not sure if you have the patches as SysX data. You know, so generally those devices, what you know, if you wanted to import patches, you would uh, save it. You know, I'm not sure what format it is. Generally, when you do patches and banks, it's going to be saved as SysX. So if you have a particular track, uh, I'll just switch over to a different project here. Okay, so, you know, so depending on what the file format is, and, you know, generally you know, like the hardware instruments are notoriously bad for communicating their patches in and out. And hence why so many people use virtual instruments because the patch management is so far better. Um, so, but if we add a MIDI track, um, what you need to do is to come over and if you have the sysx file you could just import it as it's just midi data you could import the midi file with sysx now by default sysx is can is notorious for kind of slowing down midi transmission speeds and could often like why is my midi timing horrible it's because like lots of sysx think rolling jd800 notorious for this but you want to go to midi uh and go to midi filter and uncheck sysx with that data if it's a midi file um you could just at that point if it's a midi like a midi file with the sysx data and this is often what's called a sysx dump so you hit a button on your 
module is going to take all the parameters, all the patches, transmit it as system exclusive or sysx messages. Uh, and then you could store that as a standard MIDI file. And once you're in here, go to your preferences and just come over to MIDI filter and make sure that sysx isn't being checked off. And you could see sysx data. Uh, you're not going to necessarily see it in the MIDI key editor, but where you see system exclusive data is when you go into the list editor. So, and if you need to manually add and type in sysx data, you can do it right here. So you can say, okay, what type of, I want to put, you know, system exclusive data here. Um, and then you could just start, uh, you would see all the sysx data represented there. But, you know, so know what type of information that you're sending to it. If so, generally, Patches are going to be transferred in sysx, so you want to do it, you know, if it's a MIDI information, generally it could be a MIDI file that's going to contain the system exclusive data that's, that is then sent to the instrument. And when you send it, that sysx data, it may overwrite the other uh, programs that are currently in your instrument if there's kind of, you know, a limited number of spots for presets. So... And then this is kind of the, you know, not so fun aspect of external MIDI devices that, you know, some of us have grown up with for years and why we all like virtual instruments now. So Jazzy Lumel, if you can find out, just let us know what for file format it's in. All right, so we see, uh, Greg, how can you make the faders longer for longer throw? Um, so, you know, if you wanted to, uh, let's say we hit F3, you know, if you wanted more resolution, you could just bring the fader heights higher and you could get longer throw faders like that. Um, another preference that could be set if you go to the project menu to project setup, there is a volume max setting. So if you wanted to set this to plus, it's currently defaults to plus six dB, you could set it to plus 12 dB. And, you know, I don't think the physical fader gets actually increased, but you can go from six dB at the max to 12 dB. You know, it's kind of used for some film composers and post-production. But if you're just kind of mixing, you know, you could have kind of, if you're controlling it with a control surface, you could have it, you know, whatever size fader you want and be able to control that. If you're looking for more precision, you could just kind of go from short fader to, you know, 40 millimeter to 100 millimeter fader if you want. So. All right, so we have kind of a clarification about the two different audio interfaces. So once again, we see uh, two different audio interfaces in Cubase. So, you know, generally, you know, as what Cubase needs and what Cubase expects is that when it plays audio out from track one or two, that the audio is going out at the same time. And that's kind of how, you know, most DAWs are designed so that when it plays back, that tracks are playing back and being transmitted out at the same time. When you have two different audio interfaces that aren't clocking and aren't resolving or, and aren't physically capable of that, it doesn't make sense to have audio coming out at different times, creating phase problems, different buffer sizes. So, you know, people will use a solution that will often kind of, you know, compound the latency so that we could have you know much higher latency and the tracks are kind of all less responsive and still out of time and not clocking to each other so that's just kind of a, a bad situation to have so you know it's like if your color blue on your tv shows up later than red or yellow 
you know it just doesn't make sense to do so that's why you know certain systems will allow you to share multiple interfaces but generally USB interfaces aren't included with that All right, so we see from Ash Rebel Hand Studios, uh, after selecting remove unused media and then empty trash from the media folder, Cubase commonly has a pop-up that says some files were unable to be deleted. Uh, anyone else have this issue? So, you know, make sure sometimes people may, uh, you know, overwrite a file with the same name and may delete perhaps a different file um, so I've seen that happen or sometimes when, you know, files are, you know, make sure that you've done a prepare archive first if files are in different locations or if a file is right protected as well. All right, great to see Harry Olive on. Glad you can make it today. See, Harry Olive says, I feel home again when Greg is online. That's very kind to say. All right, so we see a uh, question. Uh, hey, Greg, I was going, going some composing. I was wondering uh, how I can copy and paste automation within the piano roll. I was doing guitar pitch bend and modulation. I wanted to copy it to another part. Okay. So let's say if we have, let's say MIDI and let's say I'll just duplicate this track. Okay, and we'll draw in, so we have we have our top track selected. I'm going to draw in some pitch bend data. Okay, so I'm going to go from underneath, select it, copy. Let's come to here and go to pitch bend and paste. So just kind of a standard copy paste and you could use that uh, based uh, and that will use kind of the cursor position as like the point that it's paced from there's also if you know if, so if these were in different locations wherever kind of the cursor was so say if i take this information for my pitch bend okay so so what you want to do is and if you're using kind of the com you know to make sure that you have like that you select the events here and I'm going to just move this to the beginning of the event so come here select that copy and then paste just right over top so that'd be all you'd have to do so let me know if that makes sense. All right, so we see, uh, is there a key command to open spectral layers in Cubase Pro 12? So I think if we have the track here, when we go to extensions, that we could just choose the spectral layers as an extension. But let's see if we could set up a key command for that, um, because you may have multiple uh, multiple ARA2 extensions.
Yeah, so we can make a permanent, but, um, you know, it's because if it's once it goes into like an ARA2 interface, it may not, um, you know, we could have five or six different ARA2 editors here. So, you know, and someone may not have it. So it's kind of, you know, not set up to open that, but um but you could just do it here but you can make it permanent or you know remove the extension but you know since the ARA2 editors and the processes are not fixed inside of Cubase um that's why there's not a key command to specifically go to spectral layers but you could just click right there and launch it as an ARA2 extension All right, so we have a question. Uh, what is one of my audio interfaces that have MIDI, uh, Rain 72 Mark II interface, and shut off my Yamaha y, my Yamaha P125 MIDI keyboard? In this case, I'm not using the Rain as the MIDI instrument. Um, so is it Yamaha P125? Um, Okay, so you're not using the rain. So, um, so I'm not sure if you're running the Yamaha MIDI keyboard with the MIDI output into the rain, or if your Yamaha P125 if it's connected via USB. So, if you're running the MIDI output from the P125 into the MIDI input of the rain, and the rain is not uh, turned on, then it's not going to transmit. Uh, but if it's running as USB, it, they should work independently of each other. So maybe if you could specify that. All right. Great to see Captain Energy Music on. You don't have to worry about being late. We're just glad you can make it. Okay, so we see from Got Your says uh, I've been having issues in my lower zone following my main mixer. Um, I like it to emulate the main mixer. Sometimes it works, most times not. I will go click on the equals by visibility and select it to copy uh, mixer one. Is there a trick to make it work or just a bug? Uh, maybe it was another thing you just talked about. So I'll just do a new. I'll just open up a different project here. Okay, so let's say I don't want to see my guitars here. Okay, so now when we go to <clears throat> our mixer, <clears throat> we could we still see um, that is synchronized between the two, but you know realize that you can have uh, different synchronization setups. For this could be an independent uh, mix console. You know, so the lower zone can be independent of the mix console so if we um so it, there are situations where you know this mix console may have different uh channel visibility configurations than this so i believe that they are you know independent of each other they can operate independently of each other by design <clears throat> uh, 
All right, so we see, uh, hi, Greg, is it possible to increase volume on any one channel of a stereo region in Cubase? Thanks in advance. So I think if you just do it, you know, just do panning that it will do it for you. So let's come over to this project and I think I have a test tone oscillator that we'll do testing on. Just turn this down so you don't. Or I'll just make a. I think this. It's just a mono track, I think. All right, so let's say. I'll just make a quick stereo test tone here. Sorry, let me just. down okay so so we have kind of a steady So say we have this steady. Um, I'm, yeah, so as we pan, you could just you know bring the volume down of the other track. And if we go to our combined panner, so as you just pan on the stereo track, you can make that one side louder. Also, one of the things you can do if you select the track, come to your project menu and go to convert tracks. You can say multi channel to stereo, and then you can take that. We'll take these two tracks and say we'll do the opposite now. We'll convert project, convert, and we'll say mono to multi channel. Hit OK. And then we could just have this track, as you can see visually, with the one channel louder than the other. So a couple different approaches to that. All right. <clears throat> so we see Jovanovic 3D says, uh, heard about the shop problems, hopefully... It'll be up soon for Cubase 13 release. Seems there's something about number 13 after all. Yeah, we were, we were making that joke yesterday. All right, <clears throat> we have a question from Mike Rivera. Uh, is there a way to send Cubase to a TV for reference for film score? And what do you suggest to use for TV and film score references? Thanks, Greg. Um, so I know what some people will do is just route the audio out. <clears throat> Let me just clear my throat. <clears throat> we'll just route the audio out of the HDMI port. So if you're doing stereo, um, you know, what a lot, I see a lot of people do is, 
you know, send the audio output, switch the audio device on your system. If you have an HDMI uh, connection that you could just come into and route it out to an HDMI port. So you'll see, like, I could route it out to my Dell monitor that I'm, my Dell display monitor that I'm using. And the audio will be kind of piped out of through the HDMI connection into the TV. So you could use that as a reference for that. So, and for TV and film, there's not really a good reference system since the, the sound, you know, varies so dramatically if someone is using a sound bar, they're using a 5.1 setup, they have an Atmos setup, they have just the audio you know the horrible speakers that are included with their tv but you could just route it route the audio out to the hdmi and listen to it that way okay we have a question from david m from liverpool uh hi greg when i import a midi file into the arrange window it auto generates folders and tracks and takes up a lot of space are all those necessary? Uh, no, but they're not necessary, but it could really be dependent upon what settings you have. So let's say if we go to your Cubase preferences and when we go to import MIDI, you'll see under MIDI and go to MIDI file and you'll see under destination. So we could just have that automatically go to MIDI tracks that won't add a virtual instrument or by default, it'll go to, you know, load up into Howling and Sonic uh, in a multi-timbral mode so that when you import a MIDI file, if it has like general MIDI or XG sound sets, that it will play back the same information. So probably if you just, if you know that you're importing a MIDI file and you want it to, you know, just go to an instrument track or to a MIDI track, you could just do that and have it not automatically load up an instrument to play back from and that's what it's doing to make sure that you could hear the results of your imported MIDI file by default. Okay so we see uh, from Nickelian um, Having real issues with the MIDI remote window. I have an Akai MPC 249. I know, but I love it. Um, and just did a firmware update on it. It's still not right. The mapping, et cetera, it's really confusing to me. Um, so, you know, when you're working with this, you know, realize that once you have kind of the MIDI remote set up here, you know, there, there are different templates that will be loaded up. But, you know, once you have kind of like let's say the layout of your controller you know it's really you know assigning it if you wanted to assign you know particular functions like you could just right click on the function you know for thousands of functions and say okay i want to pick up for remote mapping i do that i move the knob on my device so we can see which knob is picked and selected here and then I say apply mapping and now that knob is controlling my control room volume so that would you know so there's a number of you know different functions that these can do so let us know if it's a you're kind of not having it set up correctly or if it's not assigning functions or you want to change the particular function that is you know that you're expecting it to control so if you could let us know like what exactly the problem is you know any midi controller can work um so but you know we can just assign these particular functions to each of the buttons quite easily so let us know exactly which part of the process is confusing and not working for you that'd be helpful all right jazzy lamel asks uh hey greg which plugin can do a telephone effect so just the channel eq so if we go to the channel eq here 
Um, there are presets for this, so we'll load a preset, and I think it's maybe AM radio or phone. So phone line, and then you could just kind of take, uh, and I'll just do it on a vocal file so you could hear it. Okay, so let's say as we're inside my place. So I come over here, what we'll dimension open up. am I in? In the end. In the end. And if we wanted to turn this off and on. You could just kind of come right over here, and if you wanted to bypass. I feel the weight. I feel the weight. So check out the phone line preset in the channel strip EQ. All right, so we see uh, about the Akai controller. It doesn't seem to be remembered by Cubase. I have to jump through hoops every time I open it. So, you know, Cubase will automatically restore the controller to its uh, particular settings. So make sure, you know, sometimes when you have controllers, you may have already previously had it configured. So when you go to, let's say, your studio menu to studio setup, it could be that, okay, you know, we have the transport controls and we use the transport controls from Mackie control. So if you see other controllers here that are using the Akai maybe for transport, just disable that because it could be taking away, uh, you know, different functions. Maybe, you know, you might have it kind of doing control surface functions like two or three different methods. So make sure that you don't have any controls here. Also make sure that, you know, that when you turn on Cubase that your controller is powered on, you know, make sure that your controller has enough USB power as well. So if it's connected on a hub with six other hard drives, it may not be getting enough power over the USB bus to communicate properly. All right, I'm gonna post the Zoom link one more time. All right. Wonderful to see Gerald Ely on the live stream. He says he's just been lurking in the back of class. As long as you're not dozing off and falling asleep, well, you're happy to be in the back of class lurking. So I've learned a lot, a lot in life by lurking. All right, so we have uh, Gaming Octopus asks, uh, "Hello, Greg. I have a question. Uh, I'm looking into, oh, I'm looking into wanting to become someone who can develop DAWs slash VST plugins. What degree field uh, would this be? I'm assuming you're a developer as well. I'm a newbie. Uh, I'm too dumb to be a developer, so I just kind of run software, and I have like such tremendous respect for software developers. You can kind of create magic." out of lines of code it's you know it's fascinating to me um but i think you know i think that most and again i'm not a developer but i think most of developing is going to be done on uh like uh, c plus plus there is kind of a like a good way maybe to get started and there are some limitations with the product but i know like artists that have gotten into developing plugins or starting their own kind of plugin company uh, will use something like Juice, which is kind of like a framework that's, I think, and again, I'm speaking from complete ignorance, uh, but that's kind of a framework that could be applied to 
creating plugins a little easier, but I think it's going to be you know, like C++ programming. Um, but, you know, check out the, you know, Steinberg does have uh, an SDK, which is a software development kit for like VST plugins and, you know, download that and become familiar with that and study that. And that'll probably give you some really great information. And I wish you the best of luck in, and I hope that you write an amazing VST plugin that we could run in Cubase. All right, so we see uh, Ash Rebel Hand Studios uh, question. Is there any way to see MIDI piano roll information and very audio wave information simultaneously so I could tune the audio to the MIDI? Uh, we'll show you a trick. So let's come over. Okay, so let's say we have a MIDI piano part. And let's say we want to do very audio on our vocal here. Okay, now there is a function within Very Audio for MIDI reference. So I'm going to open this up and I'm going to select the piano part. So now I could see the piano underlying and I can say, oh, I can move this note directly to a note on the piano. So once again, once you have Very Audio open, you'll see just, it may say no reference track. But here we could just choose a particular instrument to say, okay, I wanted to look at the MIDI guitar. I want to look at the MIDI piano part and be able to use that as the basis for the harmonies and moving notes around. So you could have the piano, uh, the you know piano roll, basically underneath as a MIDI as a reference guide. Nick is accusing Gerald of hiding under the desks. So if you get caught on, just, just pretend you need to tie your shoes. Yeah. All right, so we see from a DJ uh, about the P125 and the rain, uh, so that they're both connected separately under USB. So, you know, disconnecting one shouldn't have any impact. You know, it's like disconnecting your audio interface shouldn't make your keyboard or mouse not work. Um, so... So, but check to see if there may be on the, you know, if there's a MIDI power issue or if you're going into a hub, if you have them both connected directly, but they should function independently. Reading through comments, my chat field jumped. So, all right, so we see Secret Studios is in. All right, uh, so we see, do you know, question, do you know why Steinberg decided not to include a loudness meter in WaveLab Elements 11? I have supervision in Cubase 12, but why didn't they include it in WaveLab? So let me see if I have Elements installed on my system. Lab 
five elements. Let's take a look. So let me just look. All right, so I'll just play. So we see kind of a typical level meter here. Let me just. All right, so let me just see if we come here and so it looks like the meters aren't included in the elements version. Uh, but let's yeah so I don't know I mean I can see that it's a distinction between the two programs um, but I mean, you still have kind of the level meter here. And so as we play, but let me just see if there's. to see if there's maybe under the global analysis so it's analyzed this so while there's not a meter necessarily we could see kind of all of the loudness information so I'll just analyze here and you could see kind of the once you go into the global analysis under process you could see but uh, so but uh, I'll make I'll mention that to the team as well that people would like to see a loudness meter and I'm not sure if you get it in Cubase elements as well so it may be more of just a pro type thing Right. Always oh, wonderful to see Patrick from India on. Patrick Emmanuel A. Glad you could join us today. All right, so Patrick asked, uh, Greg, is there any talk going on waiting for Cubase 13? I would really eager to know what Cubase has for us. I uh, hope they don't disappoint us. So, you know, there is an announcement today that there is, uh, you know, that the online shop has been closed, uh, you know, temporarily due to the partner that we're using is in insolvency. So that could have an impact, but, you know, and generally we don't tease kind of, you know, like feature releases before they're available. I think that's more cruel. Like everyone wants to know the information, then when you can't have it, um, then you get upset, so. So generally when it's released, you know, we'll be happy to go through stuff. And, you know, I think there's always lots of great stuff and we'll be happy to go through it in detail. All right, so Perry Michael Allen. Uh, hello from Amsterdam. Question, I have Cubase 11 
041 I've updated to Sonoma. Will I have problems? I think I already begin to see some. Uh, I'm I'm compatible, or do I have to upgrade to Cubase 12? Help. So um, obviously, you know, I would always, you know, recommend not going f for an OS on the very first day, uh, or you know, in the first rev. Um, you know, so in you know, it's often what happens is you know. You could have something working perfectly for 92 OSs, and then it gets updated, and then it's all of a sudden uh, not the OS developer who gets blamed, but the uh, people that are doing software, when obviously there probably wasn't a change in the software. So um, so I think we'll see more official announcements um, as we go. So I know that the team has been very active. I'm not sure if they're going to go back to version 11 and update it for Sonoma. So, okay. Um, so you see, we need to bring back the function of drag and drop MIDI into the media browser. All right. Um, so sometimes I think that could be related to. Um, so I'm not sure if you want it to be a MIDI file or a MIDI loop, but. Um, so let's say if I come over here, we'll go to. Uh, loops. So, you know, if we want it to be, let's go to maybe user presets. I'm just trying to think. All right, so let's see if we do, you know, so I think most of the time it's going to be dragged out from the media. Um, but, you know, let me know if you want it to be a MIDI file or a MIDI loop. Because the MIDI loop can contain the instrument settings, you know, so we can export it as a MIDI loop. Um, but when we drag MIDI data, do you want it to be a MIDI file or MIDI loop when you drag it out? So. All right, um, we see a question from Astro Bohan Studios. Is there any way to see where a file from the media pool is actually located in my project? The media pool window has the timestamps where the file starts and stops, but I can't see them. All right. All right, so we'll go here to the pool window. select in project so once you have so let's say i have no file selected here i go to my pool window i uh, go to the vocal right click and select in project and then it will select the event so let me know if that is helpful for you So we see from Nickelian, um, my chat field jumped. So thank you, Greg. I just wanted to work the way it is MPK 249, but I'm constantly import MPK 249 script. Sometimes it's great. Other times my faders, for example, don't work. Uh, it could be in the same project. 
So let us know if you know you're connecting it directly to the computer, if it's connected to a USB port on the motherboard, or kind of a port that you know, or if it's going into a hub. Sometimes you got ports on a computer that are basically serving as a hub. But often, if something is kind of going in and out, it might be USB power. See, Ash Rebel Hand Studio says, wow, Greg, that very audio slash MIDI reference trick was right in front of me the whole time. Bravo, thanks. We'll give you that feature free for showing up today. And we just teleported it to your Cubase version. All right, so we see from Tommy C asks, hi, Greg, uh, could you talk and give a few examples of how to make a master quick control track? Uh, using an audio track and holding control, you can access different tracks as master quick control track. Okay, so um, let's see. I, I guess this is with quick controls. Maybe for the master bus, let's go to mix console. I'll come over here. So let's say this is my master out here. Okay, so and if we want to see that, we can see our input output controls. So if you want to do like your quick control assignments. It's going to be in a folder. So we can see your input output controls. We can come over here and then we can see our quick controls. So at this point, if we wanted to open up and say, okay, I want it, my quick controls to do, you know, volume, pan, you know, low, con you know, low con filters, send one and two, we could just have the quick controls automatically there. So, you know, the, if you want to do the quick control assignments, you know, so when you have a master output, it will show up in a folder on the particular track. And then you could just go to the quick controls and there's presets. So let me know if that's kind of what you're thinking of, Tommy, if that's helpful or if I misunderstood. See, Drowsy Eternal says he made a mix so loud it felt like cheating. So you just use tools well. Okay, so you see a question. Uh, what and why do these HMME tracks pop up in projects? Um, so I'm not sure what an HMME track is. Uh, so maybe if you give a little more information, what, what an HMME track, or if someone else knows that they could share the information. All right, wonderful to see Michael Pierce on. Uh, we see that he has COVID. Sorry to hear that, and we hope it's a mild case for you. Fantastic to see Graham Witcher from Royal Wooten Bassett. All right, so we see uh, how I how is it possible to make beat and cubase and melody? So you know, there's a number of ways to do it. Uh, if you wanted to just Go start with a plugin. You could do that. So let's go to this project. And I will just select we'll go to like a MIDI insert. Uh, one of the inserts that we could have is just a beat designer. And 
then what we could do is kind of as we're playing. Let's go select this. And we could select our particular sounds. So say, okay, I want to do kick. Put just maybe a clap, and we could increase the velocity. And say we just want to do a little hi hat. And then if I want to take just the hi-hat, we could adjust kind of different swings. So all sorts of great stuff you could kind of start to make beats. Uh, so check out like the Beat Designer MIDI plugin or using the MIDI Drum Editor as well. There's lots of great stuff there. All right, so we have a question from Greg Malik uh, with VST Connect Pro. If I want a remote guitarist or singer to record a track, do they need Cubase or need to own VST Connect? So if you have VST Connect with your Cubase license, the performer that you're recording just needs VST Connect Performer, which is a free download for Mac or PC, or it's available on iOS, I think, for $4.99, I think. So they don't have to be a Cubase user. Um, they just have to download the free part. So once you have it, then you can record anyone without them having to buy it. So we see Paul Claridge says uh, that he's going to check his power and his controller, and he's going to power his controller separately. All right. All right, so we see Jazzy Lou Mel uh, asks, hey Greg, uh, one of my clients is asking, is there a difference between using Groove Agent SE and Groove Agent when using V drums? So no, uh, Groove Agent, uh, the full version of Groove Agent will come with more kits, there's more patterns, there's the ability of running multiple agents simultaneously, but if you're playing just a kit, it would, the two would function in a, you know, basically the same. So. All right, so we see uh, from when does the Zoom start? Probably about five minutes. I'll go ahead and post the Zoom link for everyone's benefit here. And we'll migrate in just about five minutes. All right, so we see from JB, if a signal is recorded too high clipping into Cubase, would you be able to see that visually on a WAV file of the project window? So what you would see, yeah, you, <clears throat> it's generally you know visible 
in the clipping. Um, so like as we look at this, we <clears throat> we can see the nice little rounded corners. But if it was clipping, it may kind of look like this, where you know we could actually see it visually clip into waveform. So what we see is kind of the top amplitude is just kind of being cut off. So you would see it visually. All right, so we see from time we see uh, about the can, about the master says notes a secret menu holding down control on a blank audio track you should be able to make a master quick control track that controls a lot of tracks so if it's so i'm not sure if it's um like if you hold down let's say we're in the mixer and i have these tracks here and i say you know let's say i, I shift select or let me make sure I'm right keyboard. Okay. So if I select these by, you know, that, you know, now we could hold down alter option plus shift to quick link. So, but I'm afraid I'm still misunderstanding question. All right, so we see uh, how can I do keyboard shortcut to spectral layers? So we've already answered that, that, you know, we could go, there's no keyboard shortcut specifically to an ARA2 that's inside of Cubase because everyone could have different amounts of ARA2 extensions. But, you know, to go to load spectral layers on a track, just simply come here, you'll see the extensions, and then you could just load it right there. All right, so we see, uh, hi Greg, is there a way to show all notes on the piano keyboard, piano roll keyboard? So let's just switch projects here where we had the piano. Okay, so if you want to see all the keys that are available, so if you just go to kind of the right edge and hold down the mouse button, you could zoom vertically that way so you can see. Um, so if you want to see all 88 notes on the keyboard, if you want to see all of the notes in a particular event, we could go to your edit menu to zoom and choose zoom full. And then you could see all the notes in the event plus all the MIDI events like that. All right, so we're at 3 o'clock. I'm going to paste the Zoom link one more time. And then we'll, I'll go ahead and get the Zoom meeting started. And we'll be migrating over to there. And then we'll be having another live stream on Tuesday at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. So let me go ahead and get my Zoom going. All right, we see Brian Sawyer. Some more people joining. And again, if you haven't done any of the Zoom meetups, they're always lots of fun, and everyone just gets to know each other better. All right, we see Kevin Mehmed. All right. See Soren. See John Koskin is media. See Robbie Bowling. 
Let's see Benny on. Let's we'll get people transitioned over. All right, we see Rick Ballantyne joining us. We have All right, let's see, we have some more people. All right, so we have Nick. Thomas Van Dyke joining. Jay. All right, we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. go back over to the live stream and it looks like everyone's able to join in here let me just shut down the live stream so we're doing I'll give it another minute or two I'll post in the live stream one more time One more minute on the live stream and then we'll get started in the Zoom. All right, wait till five minutes after the hour, maybe another 10 seconds or so, then I'll end the live stream. All right, so I'm going to end the live stream and migrate over to Zoom.